Hello, everyone. From wherever you're joining us, thank you for being here today for this NSF NCAR Explorer Series conversation, deep dive into the heart of the derecho supercomputer with Jeanette Tillotson and Connor Scott. My name is Elizabeth Mays, and I'm an educator at the National Science Foundation National Center for Atmospheric Research, and will be the host of today's Explorer Series conversation. The National Science Foundation National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NSF NCAR, is a world leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science, including our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all these systems to our society. I'm glad you could all join us today. For this conversation, we will take questions throughout. So please submit any questions you might have during the talk using the Slido platform. If you scroll down this webpage, you can see the Slido window just below where you are seeing the live stream video of this event. If you haven't already, go ahead and click on the green join event button, and then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab and answer poll questions on the polls tab both of which are found in that blue bar across the top. Please be sure to join Slido to add your thoughts to our word cloud question, what do you think of when you hear supercomputer? Because we're going to get to that soon. This conversation is also being recorded and will be available on the NSF NCAR Explorer Series website. With us today, we have NSF NCAR Senior High Performance Computing Systems Engineer, Jeanette Tillotson, and High Performance Computing Systems Administrator Site Lead, Connor Scott. Jeanette Tillotson is a Senior High Performance Computing Systems Engineer in the Computational and Information Systems Lab Division of NSF NCAR, where she has worked since 2019. Since 2004, she has been part of supporting several of the fastest supercomputers in the world, including Derecho, NSF NCAR's current flagship supercomputer. Ms. Tillotson has led the student programs of several high-performance computing conferences, including the annual International Conference for High-Performance Computing, Networking, Storage, and Analysis, or SC Supercomputing Conference, and the Practice and Experience in Advanced Research Computing Conference. She mentors student workers and is working on HPC systems textbooks. Ms. Tillotson has a master's degree in computer science and cognitive science from Indiana University and a bachelor's degree in computer science from Iowa State University. In her free time, she enjoys live music concerts, playing the piano, traveling across the country in her camper van, and being involved with the local makerspace. Connor Scott is a high performance computer systems administrator site lead for Hewitt Packard Enterprise, where he has worked since August 2023. Connor started his career off in January 2016, just after graduation, with Switch SuperNAP data centers, where he held two different jobs Network Operations Center Technician and Data Center Technician Hardware Support. In April 2017, he joined eBay's BreakFix team in infrastructure operations where he supported eBay's server environment worldwide, which included a three-year assignment to Germany to support EU infrastructure operations. Connor Scott has a Bachelor's of Science in Computer, Computer Information Systems from the University of Texas at Tyler. Connor and Jeanette, um, we will be getting to talk to you soon. And so go ahead and say hello. Um, and before I turn it over to you all, let's go ahead and check in on our audience thoughts on our word cloud. So Chris and Fletcher, could you please share Slido for us? And we're gonna take a look at what do you think of when you hear supercomputer? Oh, yeah. Uh well, hello, uh, I'm Jeanette Tillotson, um, and I'm taking a look at your word cloud now. Uh, yes, I see lots of processing power. Uh, it's uh, super cool. I think that I agree with that. Lots of really cool, big and fast. Uh, that's certainly true. Uh, yes, Cray um, is a, 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 the first supercomputer was built by Seymour Cray 
and the Cray company. So that's uh, that's good too. Lots of parallel processing. Oh, an adrenaline rush. I like that too. Ah, uh, yes. All right. Well, thank you for doing filling out our word cloud. Connor, do you want to say hi? Yeah, we gotta get. He's got to get unmuted here. There. Hello. Thanks for joining today. Great. So could you each please tell us a little more about your role and the work you do with the Derecho supercomputer? Sure. Um, uh, as as uh, Elizabeth said, I am a systems engineer, um, which means that I uh, stand up, support uh, the systems, the high performance systems that uh, NSF NCAR uses. Uh, and that means the supercomputers, which we'll talk about today. It also means the storage systems, uh, fancy network systems, um, and also facilities. Uh, a systems engineer does quite a bit with the facility, uh, you know, so like housing the computer, uh, you know, cooling it, things like that. What about you, Connor? So I am a HPC systems administrator, site lead. So a part of what I do here is I help support the supercomputer, obviously. We triage and we fix the computers as they go down. And when a company orders a supercomputer, I am a part of the team that is supporting it, that HP provides. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for being here today. So everyone joining on this call today is using some sort of computer. And most of us have heard the word supercomputer, but not know what it is. So let's see what our audience might know about supercomputers already. So let's see those answers to the Slido for the supercomputers have which of the following parts. All right, looks like 100% of our respondents responded that it has memory, nodes, network, cooling system, and I think processors were in there too, but only 84% um, think that there are blades in a supercomputer. Um, so, Jeanette, how did they do? Yeah, so uh, a supercomputer has all the parts that your computer does um, in your house, your laptop or your desktop machine. Um, and it also does have ours, has blades. So this is a way of making a supercomputer dense. So we can take four nodes or four individual computers and we can put them on one in one blade or in one box. Um, so we can make it really dense. Uh, that means this computer would be a lot bigger, physically bigger, if we didn't make it dense and, and pack four machines into a very small space, which we'll show later on. So that's a, a nice lead into what we'll talk about later. Great. Um, and so what else makes supercomputers different from a normal computer? You talked about them being really um, dense. Um, how how do those all get connected? Yeah, so in Derecho, we have a lot of computers, and uh, they are connected with a network. And you can actually see Derecho's network right here behind us. Um, you can see these black cables right here. These are actually copper network cables. Um, we use those to communicate in between the racks. So these cables will go to other pieces inside this rack. And then these light blue cables, these are uh, actually fiber. They use glass and light to communicate. And we have those going between the racks. So you can see the cables go up into a hole and then they go over to the other racks and come down and connect. And those, with all those wires all the way down, uh, that's how derecho, all the nodes can communicate with each other. And that lets them all work together on a problem. Great. 
Thanks for um, that description of a supercomputer, how they're all connected. So it sounds like a su supercomputer is like many normal computers or very high quality computers that we might use day to day, um, but they're all connected together with a network and they're all working together and they're really powerful. Um, and to, in order to understand how powerful they are, um, let's take a look at how our audience did on the ranking, the metric prefixes that are commonly used in computing, because when we're talking about computing processing, I know we're talking about some really big numbers. So let's review those metric prefixes. All right, so we had asked our audience to rank from uh, smallest to largest. Um, with largest at the top. So we have mega, giga, tera, peta, and exa. I wonder if this is showing up in the opposite order. Let's go ahead and look at your slideshow, Jeanette, and see how, how our audience did. Yes. <laughs> Give a chance here to switch over to my slide. So yeah, so the uh, because we are talking about very large things, it is good to use these prefixes um, so that we can, uh, you know, not have to have, you know, <laughs> just 10 to the 18th or whatever it is. Um, and yeah, that's in the opposite order. So mega is the smallest. So you can see there, that's a million or one followed by, uh, I think it's six zeros. Um, and then, uh, then we have the giga, which is a billion. Um, or you can start to think about like two million or two times million or a thousand million. Um, so the giga. Uh, and so that's uh, 10 followed by nine zeros or one followed by nine zeros, excuse me. Um, and then Terra is a trillion. And then the next thousand is Peta, which is actually a quadrillion. Um, and then Exa, we actually get to Exa in our field. There are Exa machines, which we'll talk about what, uh, what we would use to determine how fast they are. So the exa is 10 followed by, or one followed by 18 zeros. Um, and so that would be a quintillion. Um, so yeah, these are very large numbers that we use to talk about it. And you're used to this to some degree. Uh, you often talk about the gigabytes in your machine, in your memory, um, and that would be a billion bytes. So, you know, you've heard, you should have heard of some of these in your typical laptop or desktop machine. Wow, those those are some big numbers. So we'll we'll get a little bit more into the into those numbers as well. But we do have a question from the audience um, regarding your roles. So the question is, how do engineer versus administrator roles break down with respect to hardware and software? Yeah, do you want me to take that? Yeah, we can do both parts. <laughs> so, um, so I would say a uh, systems engineer, uh, that really we're talking about like designing um, and, you know, so when we get these machines, we spend a lot of time before we ever get the machine uh, determining, you know, what kind of uh, support would need, we need to have in not only the data center itself physically, but also like in our other systems and how well they can support um, any new machines that we have. That means making sure we have networking space for them, making sure we have uh, the kind of bandwidth to connect it to all the other components that we have here in the data center. Um, and so kind of engineer is like a high level thing. Uh, so designing and then eventually implementing those things where an administrator, what would you say, Connor? We are responsible for maintaining the hardware. So we're, we work at more of the hardware level where we are making sure that the system is operating correctly. And when, when systems go down, we triage them and find out what's wrong with them. And then we, it's the support team that I lead, we, also have hardware support um, engineers, and they're the ones that are out physically performing the repair that we find. And then another 
responsibility is we do firmware upgrades, so we make sure and we support the customer when they go through system upgrades. But as you can see, like Connor mostly deals with one machine. He deals with derecho. Um, so that's kind of an administrator would deal with a single machine and what's going on in this, and an engineer would deal with lots of different machines and how they're all connected together into one big system. All right, awesome. And I think we'll get into a little bit more later about um, what kinds of programs are run on, on derecho. Um, but first, let's talk a little bit about that computer itself. So, Connor, is that the supercomputer derecho right behind you now? It is. Could you tell us a little bit more about this supercomputer that's at the NSF NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center? So, derecho has a total of 2,570 compute nodes. Each node, and we have 248, 2,488 compute or CPU only nodes, and then we have 82 GPU only nodes. And total, we have 323,712 AMD Milan CPUs. We have a total of 680 terabytes of total system RAM, and we have 328 NVIDIA A100 GPUs. And the last benchmark we did for the system was 18 or 19.87 petaflops. So this term flops in the specs, I know that this was a new term to me when I started learning about supercomputers, because um, this is a different term than I look at processing power when, you know, looking at a, a typical laptop computer. So let's go to the audience and see if they were familiar with that term or not, and see the answer to the questions, which was the term flop stands for... Floating point operations per second. Jeanette, was 82% yeah. of our audience correct? That is correct. It stands for floating point operations per second. Um, and so a floating point operation is just a math operation. Um, it's kind of the, the most complicated math problem that the math processor in the machine can do. And so then we give it a problem and we know how many math operations it's going to take to do that problem. And then we tell Derecho to do that problem. And then we, we time it with a clock. And then at the end, we figure out, take the number of operations, right? Divide it by how many seconds it ran. And that's how we get flops. So as you can see, Derecho being 19.87 petaflops. Again, a peta being a quadrillion. Or you can think of it as a thousand billion. So it can do 19.87 thousand billion floating point operations per second. Wow. That is a lot of mathematical equations. Uh, that's almost an unfathomable uh, number. So let's see, that's 20. That's almost 20, right? Rounding up 19.8 with 15 zeros after it. So let's go to our Slido question to our audience to see if we can get a better idea of just how big that number and how many mathematical equations they can do. So the question was, if everyone on Earth was able to do one mathematical, equation, one mathematical equation per second, so from the youngest to the oldest person alive, how long would it take us to complete the amount of mathematical calculations that derecho can complete in one second? So we have... 67% of our audience says 100 years, 29% of our audience says 10 years, 5% says one month, and 0% say 10 hours. So what do, what do we say? What is the answer? The answer is one month. One right. month. All right. So we can give ourselves a little more, more credit um, there in terms of our, our computational um, abilities. And so that was interesting, Jeanette, you said that 
you run in order to determine how many flops that derecho has. Um, is that the same way that uh, supercomputing power or processing power is measured with all supercomputers? Yeah, it is. There's a special software that was specifically designed to uh, calculate the flops that a machine can achieve. And all, all super, well, not all, but most supercomputers um, on the planet, not just in the United States, but across the planet, will run that software. And then they report that number to an organization called the Top 500. You can actually go to the top500.org uh, you know, website and you can see a list of the top uh, you know, 500 uh, you know, fastest machines in the world. Um, at least of the ones that have been reported to the top 500. There are some machines that don't report to the top 500, but most do. And there is actually machines that have reported that are exa flop machines. So they can do one quintillion. So, you know, wow. floating point operations per second. And it, well, this is 20, right? So that's like 50 times uh, the speed of derecho. Some supercomputers um, here uh, on the planet. Uh, the one that comes to mind is Frontier, uh, which is at Oak Ridge National Lab, and it is an exascale machine. It can do over uh, exaflop, um, you know, performance. So, wow, that is incredible. And so, with all of this processing power that Derecho has as as a supercomputer, um, what are the main uses for this the Derecho supercomputer? Yeah. So, um, you know, the supercomputer at NCAR, at NSF NCAR, the derecho here, um, it does mostly earth science. That is what uh, NSF NCAR is focused on. So anything that studies earth science, uh, they study things like the ocean, they study things like the sun, they study obviously the atmosphere. Um, anything along those lines is what derecho does. Uh, but for the biggest projects that we do, uh, the first one is the Community Earth Systems Model. And what uh, NSF NCAR does is they go out, they take all these different models of all those different systems I just mentioned, the sun, the ocean, the atmosphere, and I think volcanoes, and there's some other things they have also that they add into the CESM model. And then once they've built that model, they start with current Earth conditions, and then they run that model forward for 100 years years and then they see what comes out so they can that's they can whenever you hear a prediction like in a hundred years this is how much the earth is going to warm up or anything along those lines at least coming from the united states it's been done with this cesm model and we're currently on our fifth model uh, they're running it right now on derecho and they're working on building the sixth one uh, for to start running once they're done with the fifth model. So this is the largest project that we run on, on Derecho. Um, another project that's really important to us and here at NSF NCAR is the, Ant I have to look at this, Antarctic Mesoscale predictive, predictive Prediction System. I don't even know, we call it AMPS. So Antarctic Mesoscale Prediction System. And AMPS, what that is, is we actually do the forecasting the daily weather forecasting for Antarctica. And so this is important for scientists. They need to know like what, uh, what's the weather gonna be like before they venture out and you know get caught in a storm. So we do the Antarctic prediction every day and give that to the Antarctic scientists. Um, but the other predictions that you see in the United States, like the daily weather forecasting that you might receive for your local uh, place, is done by NOAA. So the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, I think, uh, NOAA. So uh, NOAA does all those predictions. Uh, we don't do any of that except for Antarctica. So those are the two I, the main projects that Derecho uh, does, but there's lots of other science, earth science that gets done on Derecho. Wow, yeah, that sounds like it's doing some really important work uh, behind you right now. Um, speaking yep. of all of these acronyms, um, there is a lot of them. Um, is Derecho the name itself? Is that an acronym that stands for anything specific? Or how did it get its name? 
No, it, it was it was named by uh, school children in Wyoming. They had a contest and had elementary school children put in names, and then we picked from those names. And derecho uh, was one of them. I, you might know what a derecho is. Uh, it's I think it stands for big wind in Spanish, um, and it's just it's one of those straight line winds that they can get. So we get these straight line winds that can last, that can be a hundred miles long, these winds, and they can last, these very powerful winds, they can last for a long time, like an hour. Um, and so when these derecho winds come in, they can really be destructive. Um, and those are becoming more common nowadays as, as the climate warms. And so on uh, climate change, right? So, uh, that, that was the name that was put forth by uh, one of the elementary school children, and we liked it as a name, so we, we picked Derecho. That definitely sounds like a really fitting name based on your location and even the types of mm -hmm. work that's run on, on the computer. Yeah. Um, we do have, uh, you know, talking about what Derecho is used for, um, we thought it'd be fun to hear from the audience what they would use a supercomputer for. So we can pull up that Slido question and see some of those responses. All right, so. Yeah, cryptography. Yeah, definitely cryptography, that's for sure. Um, yes, and let's see, what do we got here? Multidimensional calculations, yeah, modeling, Bitcoin. Mining, that always comes up. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, Bitcoin mining actually probably wouldn't be very good on derecho because it's very expensive to run derecho. You probably wouldn't get your Bitcoin. Uh, by the time you got your Bitcoin um, from the mining, you would have wasted too much electricity for it to be worth anything. Um, yeah, again, the global climate system, which is what we do. Uh, yeah, solving problems of the human race. A lot of supercomputers are working on lots of different problems that we face as a, you know, in the human race. Yes, a lot of parallel processing. Supercomputers are doing parallel processing. Um, yeah, so any kind of data conversion or data processing, a lot of supercomputers do that. Um, and modeling, like a lot of, there's a lot of other modeling, like tectonic plate movements, that was done with supercomputers. You know, we kind of took the where we the plates are now and ran it backwards. Um, they do that with astronomy too. They model how galaxies are formed and what happens when galaxies uh, collide, uh, things like that. So they model a lot of stuff in astronomy. Um, yeah, any large computation, of course. Simulations, AI. That's the new thing now too. Doing AI modeling. Um, yeah, any kind of scientific research, fusion research for sure. Yes. Um, continuously calculating the numbers. I don't think anybody's calculating the number of atoms in the world. I, I don't think a supercomputer is doing that. <laughs> but yeah, any kind of data processing that's large, large amounts of data, uh, that's, a, that's a, a good thing for a computer to do, supercomputer, to use a supercomputer for. Yep. Yeah, those are some uh, really some creative responses in there yeah. and some very similar to the work that is currently being done on derecho. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned that bit mining on derecho might not uh, be the most economically feasible uh, effort. And so we did have a question from the audience on Slido um, that we could go to. Um, and the question is, how much power does the computer use when running at full capacity? You know, I, I, I think I might know. It's it's somewhere around two and a half megawatts so wow. again mega being a million so two and a half million watts that is certainly a lot and and do you know where most of that electricity comes from up in wyoming to power the supercomputer what did you say oh yeah so we we get it from the energy company um and i don't know where wyoming where Black Hills, uh, I think their coal-fired plants would be my guess. I don't know if there's a lot of renewable energy. I do know there is an initiative at NSF NCAR to uh, get our supercomputers totally powered by renewable energy. So we are uh, working on that. It is a lot of power, though. 
But we are working on that and seeing what we can do, especially as renewable energy becomes more efficient um, and you know better better uh, technologies and things like that. We might be able to get that two and a half uh, million watts from renewable energy. So we are working on that. That's great. And we do have another question from the audience about derecho um, that we can go to on Slido. And I know that it isn't your team that um, allocates runtime on the machine, uh, but the question is, is there any possibility available to provide free remote access with derecho supercomputer for developing countries um, researchers? Um, so I guess a, a larger question coming out of this is just how is runtime allocated on the supercomputer? How is it determined who um, is able to access and use the supercomputer? Yeah, so because it's an NSF machine, um, you know, the research being done on uh, derecho is done by uh, NSF institutions. So uh, you wouldn't be able to be on our machine unless you were affiliated in some way with a US, you know, NSF funded organization. Um, so we would not, I don't think there's any way for developing countries to get access, except for again, through the partnership with somebody here in the United States. Um, and then the way we allocate those hours is people actually put in proposals and they ask for time on the supercomputer and then we there's a group that's outside of my division that actually reviews those proposals and then they determine who gets what time so then they give the researcher a certain number of uh core hours and then we record that allocation and then we track how much time they use and when they're uh they've used up their hours uh then we don't let them run anything else so that's uh how that's allocated all right, that, that makes sense. That's interesting. Um, so let's get to talking a little bit more about the computer behind you. Um, so you mentioned the networking um, and you showed us a little bit about the networking behind you um, on Derecho. Um, was there anything else you wanted to share on the, the behind Derecho where you are now? Nope. That, you know, just that this is this is all the back of the machine. So this this is the you know behind the the back of the nodes and the and everything the rack of the racks, and then it's all just networking back here. So it's all just uh, networking equipment and then the cabling between them. And how much of the computer would you say is actually behind you? It looks like I can I can see one, two, three, four, five racks. How many racks are there total? Yeah, there's eleven. Uh, oh, 10, sorry, excuse me. Connor knows these things, 10. And actually, you can only see uh, maybe three. So I should show that oh. this is actually yeah. a rack. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm with. counting that as two. I see. That's right. And there are 10 of these. Oh, so wow. There are 10 so of those in derecho. So we're only seeing a full two. So it's five times That's bigger. Right. All right. right. Well, you're in the back. So I presume then there must be a front to the machine. Do you think we could take a look at it? All right. Well, while you're heading over unmute, to the unmute. front, <laughs> Get Connor so he can talk here. Yes, let's go around to the front, Connor. While you're heading around to the front, let's see. Now that we saw that networking cables, let's see what the audience thought in terms of how many miles of networking cable there are in derecho. All right, so it looks like 57% said seven. It's always a good guess to go with the biggest. About 20% said 5.5 miles, 14% said four miles, 10% said 2.5 miles, and nobody said one mile of networking cables. Yeah, so there are actually five and a half miles of networking cables in derecho wow all that cabling you saw comes to five and a half miles total that is a lot of cabling going through the derecho so it looks like you made it to the front now you did 
So this is a, the front side of a Doratio compute cabinet. Um, each cabinet has 64 blades in eight chassis. The blades individually are each, every handle and how, and they're powered by rectifiers in the middle of the cabinet. And so, then these, oh, oh. Oh, I had a quick question. Um, just what could you define a little bit more? What exactly is a blade and what is a, a chassis, chassis that you mentioned? Of course. So a blade is essentially on ratio for laptop computers. So if you can think of a blade like that. And a chassis, the chassis is just what contains all of the blades together and connects it to the networking on the back side of the system. Okay, so the chassis is kind of like the structure and the blade is like one of the units of the is, yes. computer. Awesome. And so four laptops all together. I know just my one laptop on its own can get really hot, especially when I'm using it a lot. Um, so what is the cooling like uh, for so How the ratio? Cool? The ratio is 100% liquid cooled, so it's fanless. So each blade is connected through these hoses that go to manifolds, and the manifolds are go up the two sides of the cabinet, next up to the top, and this system on this side is actually the CDU, the cooling distribution unit that cools four ratio cabinets. And ratio has a total of three cooling distribution units. Each cooling distribution unit uses 12 gallons of a antifreeze-like coolant. And then that coolant is cooled through a heat exchanger using facility water. And the facility water that we use is 18 degrees Celsius. Wow. So pretty cold water going, going through there. And so there's two more of those cooling units. With there them. is. And I know we saw a pan of the full front side of the derecho. It has some artwork on it as well, or is that a, an image that was developed by one of these models or? It looks I, like- I think I think it is. I do believe that was a calculation done of a derecho, an actual derecho weather event. And so that is a, a picture of that derecho event that's on the front of derecho. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty neat to have a picture of the work that the computer is doing on it. All right, so um, we do have another question from the audience. Um, you know, th when thinking about my computer, for example, there's data storage on it. Um, supercomputers, I presume, are somewhat different. And so the question is, do you use SAN or NAS for data storage? Well, that's a great question. You, you kind of know some storage. Um, so I should point out that Derecho itself doesn't have any storage in the nodes. Uh, it would just be a lot. But as we remember, there's 2,570 blades or uh, nodes, sorry, in Derecho. And if each one of those had a storage device, there'd be a lot to go wrong. Um, and plus, it's expensive uh, to put st local storage. So we don't. It's just cheaper and it's a lot less that can go wrong with Derecho. Instead, we have external storage systems. And a NAS or a SAN wouldn't be fast enough for what we need. We, because these computers are running fast and in parallel, remember if you got all those nodes working together, they all might be writing to the storage system at the same time. So we run big parallel storage systems. We run two here. We run one that's a GPFS, a Global Parallel File System. I'm pretty sure is what that stands for. And it's just a big parallel file system that's uh, developed by IBM. And we run that, and that's where the users store their uh, home directory, their personal like uh, 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 programs and things that they're going to run. 
um, or any other things they might need, keys and things like that. And they also store their app. We have applications we store there that we make available to the researchers to run. Um, we also have some just space there that they can store data. Um, and so that's on our GPFS system. And then we also have a Lustre uh, parallel file system. It's the same idea, it's just doing using a different type of software. Um, and there we use that for scratch. So that means while the researchers are running their calculations, they can put their data on the Lustre file system, parallel file system, and that way they can read their data very quickly and write very quickly back out. Um, so we parallelize our storage systems. So a NAS wouldn't really work. We have like, I don't know, you know, some 3,000 maybe more machines that access those network or uh, file systems. And so we need something much faster than would be able to be provided by a NAS. And how large are those file systems? Oh, I don't know offhand. In, in, in the petabyte range, like wow. in the tens of petabytes. Yeah. Wow. I believe the, the cluster store is what we call the storage system for the ratio, and that is like 12 petabytes yeah. of total storage. Oh, yes. One, two, zero petabytes. Uh, ben, ben has just come around. He's my, one of my colleagues, and he's listening in, and he's just told me that 120 petabytes, I think, is now our GPFS file system. So it's in the, you know, just over 100 petabytes. All right. Well, going back to uh, the computer behind you, you mentioned all of those blades. Um, do you think we could take a look inside of one of those blades? Yes. Ooh. Let's awesome. take a look at a blade. All right. Well, while you go back to that part, let's go to the next Slido question, um, which was the first NSF NCAR supercomputer was more powerful than our cell phones of today. So 18% of you thought that was true and 82% of you thought that was false. So what is that? answer was the very first NSF NCAR supercomputer more powerful than our cell phones of today? Yeah, you got that right. So it, it was, it, um, the supercomputer was not more powerful than your cell phone. We did some quick calculations this morning. Um, you, uh, iPhone 14 is now two teraflops, which is crazy to think about. And the first uh, NSF NCAR supercomputer was 160 megaflops. So we're going from 160 million flops to 2 trillion flops on your phone. So it's about 12,500 times more powerful, your phone, than the first NCAR supercomputer. Wow, that's pretty incredible. And uh, yeah. a lot smaller too, I'm sure, our phones are <laughs> than the first supercomputer. Yes. Um, but it looks like Connor's back there at that blade. So let's uh, let's take a look. And Connor, can you show us around the blade? I will. So this is a EX425 Wyndham blade. Wyndham is a internal code name that HPE and Cray developed. So inside this blade, this blade takes 380 volts. 380 volts from, from a power cable. And that power cable is separated into four separate connections for each node. And each node has a 48 volt voltage converter that we call an, an acronym is, is an IVOC. So every blade here at NCAR has two boards. These boards are called node node cards, and on each node card, there is two nodes. Two nodes has two processors and 16 DIMMs, or memory modules, I guess you could say. Um, and I have right here, so this is the Cassini Sawtooth NIC. So this is a dual injection NIC, so it, it supports 200 gigs, and each 
each one of these channels supports a, a node. And could you remind and, us again, what is a, a NIC? Is that the acronym you're using? A NIC is a network interface card. Okay. And again, when you're talking about the nodes, each node is, is kind of, we can think about it like a, a laptop computer. Yes. Okay. So, yep, so more parts. A, a node is essentially each side of every board. So yeah, so we have like one node, two node, three node, four node. And how big is that looking? Let's see, I can see your hands now, but how uh, wide or long is that blade in feet approximately? Oh. Three? My, my guess is three, a little over three feet. Wow. That's almost my whole arm. That's very, that's a pretty big uh, piece of very the supercomputer long. there. And how many of those blades are there again in the supercomputer? There are 2,000. Yeah, that's like, well, we'd have to do a little calculation because there are the 82 GPU blades, they only have two nodes on them. So there's 164. So that's 82 blades for the 164 nodes. If you have Subtract the 2488, right? So 1,244 1, CPU blades plus, so somewhere around 1,300 blades. 1,300. Yeah. 1, oh, no, we gotta, we gotta divide by four. I divided by four. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Times by four. <laughs> 24, that's 600 blades, and then yeah. another 100, and, no, another 40. I'm doing the other way. So I'm multiplying by two, on the fly. 200, 200 blades. Is that a good guess? You do racks too, like. No. So it's more like. 600. 600 blades. 600, it's gotta be 600. Wow. We have 10 cabinets, 64-ish. 64 blades Somewhere per between cabinet. 500 and 600. That's our quick guess, uh, just off the top of our heads. Wow, <laughs> that, that's a lot of blades. And. So, yeah, go ahead. No, you, you can go ahead. Uh, well, is there anything else you wanted to show us on that? Yes. Blade? So we mentioned cooling before. How these blades are cooled is they go through the front. This whole plate, you can see this red material is copper. We use a mix of copper and an aluminum, and it is the what's referred to a cooling loop, and it sits directly against the each motherboard, I guess you could say. And that's what provides cool, cooling. It, it's plate to plate. So as the liquid moves through each part, it's pulling the heat off of those components and cooling them. And this is a CPU cooling plate. And underneath you can see this is a processor. And in this processor, on top of it, it has a thermal interface material we call thermal grease and other pads that provide compression and um, spacing for and protection for the for the boards. And I will take this off real quick so we can take a look at one of the processes. All right. And so, is it often that you ha you Connor need to go in and do maintenance on these blades, such as we're seeing? you know, taking them out and working on the actual hardware? It is. It, we, we do daily work on, on these systems. We, off the top of my head, we probably work on eight blades a week, I would say. Now, that's not the whole blade having a problem. So typically, we'll trace a problem down to either a specific node or a board that is having a problem. Either it doesn't power on, or there's a processor that is bad, or a DIMM failure. Most of what we do is replacing DIMMs. Hmm. So and I would also say, as he's, as he's mucking with the processor here, I would also say that, you know, that processor is, is very similar to the processor that's in your laptops or your desktop. It's, you know, an AMD processor. It's just a high end, right? A, 
probably a top of the line AMD processor is what that is. But it's just the you know processors like you'd get for any other computer. So this is a AMD Epic. It is a 64 core CPU that has 128 threads and it can do 3.5 gigahertz overclock. And you can see the bottom plate. This is what actually rests on top of the on top of the socket. Sockets are very fragile. They have these fingers that each finger, if you look if you look at this processor on the bottom, there are these small little dots in each finger and the CPU socket next to each dot. So it's very fragile. Wow, very so easy to, to damage. So that's one of the processors where all that, where the computations are, are taking place in the supercomputer? Yes. CPU is essentially what would be a brain in your body. Hmm. It helps, it organizes all of these systems together to perform what you need it to perform. I see. Wow. Well, thank uh, you so much for showing us the, the inside of that blade. Um, I, I do, oh, oh, go ahead. Go, I was going to say, do we have, do we have another minute? Because I want to look at, I want to see one more thing. Okay, yeah. Do we have another minute? One more thing. You, yeah, let's look. Let's take a look, and um, and then we have a take few. Take the top off a memory on. chip, would you? Take the take the top, so you can see those are just dims, and these are again really similar to the kinds of dims you would have in your machine, your, a machine that you would own. Um, this you know, is in this, the yeah. same form factor that you use in a desktop computer. Yeah, yeah. It's just you know the they're I don't know how how big are the dims on how big are the dims on Derecha. There are and, 16 gigs. And 16 what are gig DIMMs gigs. again? Could you define what DIMMs are again? They're, a, they're the memory module. The okay. MM is memory module. We don't remember what the DI stands for. <laughs> <laughs> dual link, dual interconnect, inter I don't know. Ben's trying to say something, but it doesn't matter. It's just a memory module. That's what the MM is. OK. So is that like the working memory? Because you talked about the storage system and that's different than the working memory in the computer. Yes, that's yes. correct. Great. All right. So, you know, Derecho is our latest supercomputer, but I know we've had previous supercomputers in the past. So what does happen to our outdated supercomputers or the supercomputers that we're no longer using? Oh, what happens to them? We we recently sold a supercomputer, right? Uh, we sold our previous machine, Cheyenne, um, and we sold that to um, a third party that will part it out. They basically are going to take the old supercomputer and they're going to take the usable parts from it and they're going to use those in other machines to like, um, you know, to... Uh, fix those other machines, provide parts for machines. So and that's pretty that common. System, and that system was a SDI system. Yeah, also an HPE machine as well. HPE purchased SGI uh, after we had acquired our SGI machine. But, um, but yes, it was an SGI ICE machine to be exact. Um, and then we have had a supercomputer at NCAR, NSF NCAR, that was sold to a university and they ran it for a while. So that does happen too. Uh, Cheyenne was uh, the our most recent one that we sold to the third party that parted it out. That machine was a little too uh, long in the tooth. It was leaking some of its coolant and things like that. So it really wasn't one we could continue running. But some of our previous machines were able to be sold and continue running at other organizations. So they can. And NCAR's first supercomputer was a Cray system. Yeah, it also, was, the first supercomputers were built by Seymour Cray. I mentioned that earlier. And, and then he built a company around that. And we have the very first supercomputer that NSF NCAR purchased. And it's in the lobby of the NWSC building. So you can come here and see it if you want. Oh, wow, that's great. So it sounds like we have a very long history of, of using supercomputers at yeah. NSF. 
NCAR. So we have a few more questions uh, for you, Jeanette and Connor. Um, so there's some questions from maybe people who are interested in, you know, getting into a similar career path as you all have. So one question is, as a student, is there a preferred programming language that we should learn? Ah, so there's lots of different programming languages that get used on Derecho. The main ones, though, are still Fortran. There's still some Fortran going on, um, which is an older formula translation, I think. I can't remember what Fortran stands for, but it's an old language that was built for doing math. Um, so uh, a lot of researchers, because they do a lot of math, uh, they still use Fortran. Um, and we also have a C programming language. You know, that's C as in cat or Charlie, right? If you're doing the, the military designations, but C um, and, uh, and all its variations. There's other variations of C, C++ and things like that. Uh, that's still heavily used um, in HPC and on Derecho. Uh, Python is becoming a very popular language uh, because it's a lot easier to use than C and Fortran. So it's a lot easier to program in it. Um, and so a lot of researchers are using it. It's not as performant as C and Fortran, but researchers trade some performance for uh, you know, ease of programming. So uh, that's another common one. And there are many other languages that are still used. Uh, there's still uh, Julia. I've heard somebody was asking a Julia question the other day, which is like a Pascal, a new Pascal variant. Um, trying to think of anything else off the top of my head. Ben might think of some. Ben's got a lot. Um, so it sounds like, yeah. though, it sounds like there's not one oh, oh. that you necessarily need to learn, that there's still a variety and, and multiple different languages are useful. Maybe it depends on what kind of field you go into or what kind of programming you're doing. Yeah, and what works for you. I think that's also what's familiar to you and what works for you. But uh, if you were going to learn a language, I would suggest starting with Python. It has just become a ubiquitous language. It's, it's heavily used by people. And it's a very good starting language. And then after you learn Python, I would suggest you learn C. That's what I would say. So just because it's so much more performance, uh, you, if you're looking for high performance, which we are, uh, C is the way to go, or some other, like Fortran. But Fortran's kind of getting uh, to the point where it's not as used anymore. Uh, but uh, it's still uh, well worth learning it if you're going into the sciences. So, so we, we have another Slido question, um, again, along the career path. So what types of degrees do you, the presenters, have? And did your degrees help you in obtaining your current job? I would say yes. <laughs> what, what, you want to say your degrees again, Connor? So my, my degree is a computer, it's a bachelor's of science in computer information systems. And it definitely helped me get the job that I have now. Helped give me a foundation that I could build off of. Yeah, and, and, I, and I have a master's degree in computer science. And it, that certainly uh, is useful in my current, I use it all the time, my computer science knowledge. But one thing I would mention is I work with lots of people that don't have um, a computer science or related field degree. Um, I, one of our team members is a biologist. Uh, so he was a biologist. He was doing calculations and stuff like that, um, using supercomputers, and then decided he wanted to help on the other side rather than the biology side. So he switched over to computers, and he just has a biology degree. Um, I know people in my field that don't have a degree at all. So they started off like on help desks and then worked their way up to being assistant administrator and then eventually worked their way up into doing HPC systems work. So there's lots of ways to get to this field um, and become an HPC systems engineer or administrator. Wow. And there are a lot of team members even who are through the HP support sub don't have degrees either. So yeah. a degree isn't necessarily a barrier to getting a, a job like this. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of pathways in, into that career field. Yeah. Um, and I want to say thank you, Jeanette and Connor, for being here today and chatting with us about supercomputers. 
Um, and I also want to say thank you to our team behind the scenes, uh, Fletcher, Chris, Summer, Ben, Dan, Aliyah, and Evie for all supporting this conversation today. So we hope to see you all next time and have a great rest of your day.